Welcome, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us in this for this future tense event titled "Is China Canceling the Internet?" I'm Andres Martinez. I'm the editorial director of Future Tense and a professor of practice at Arizona State University's School of Journalism, the Walter Cronkite School. Uh, Future Tense, for those of you who haven't been with us before, is a partnership between Arizona State University, New America, and Slate Magazine, and we explore the impact of technology on society. And I'm really thrilled for today's conversation, which is so timely and so aligned with the things that we're curious about at Future Tense. And we have two wonderful experts to, uh, to, to learn from today. Both happen to be former New America fellows, so, so it's, uh, it feels like we're, we're all in the family here. Uh, Yiling Yu is based in Beijing, and so uh, extra thanks for waking up early where you are to, to join this conversation. Uh, Yiling is a writer based there who is working on a um, narrative nonfiction book about the internet in China and has done fantastic reporting for all sorts of locations, The Economist, The New Yorker, New York Times Magazine, Wired, um, looking at this interplay of technology society um, in China and, and, and the internet in particular. So we're really thrilled and lucky to have you. And Daniel kurtz is the editor of uh, Foreign Affairs Magazine, um, former uh, um, policy analyst in the State Department um, Office of uh, Strategic, uh, I'm sorry, policy planning staff. And uh, <clears throat> during his New America Fellowship, and subsequently, he published an amazing book called The China Mission, which is one of, one of my favorite books from pre-pandemic times, which looked at the George Marshall diplomatic mission in China and its amazing history, and it reads like, like great fiction. Um, and then I just have to point out that I have the magazine here, um, your latest issue, which has a lot of great um, content related to what we're going to be talking about today. Um, and I, I always carry this around because it just gives me some gravitas that I otherwise uh, don't have. Um, but I liked the, the, the idea that what we want to be talking about is sort of um, at the macro level, kind of, you know, we, there's a lot of talk in places like Washington, particularly in Washington, about national competitiveness and, you know, tech powers. And it even, it even encroaches upon domestic policy. You know, you have this sort of uh, discourse in DC that well, you know, we have to be careful how we regulate the likes of Facebook and 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 Google um, and our tech giants because you know we need these our tech titans to go up against you know our Chinese competitors, right? And that this is a, a an argument that I think Silicon Valley has gotten a lot of uh, mileage out of, and people are very worried about competitiveness on you know AI or. Uh, you know, the race to 5G, you, you name the technology, there's, there are people who, who want to sort of treat this as a, as a contest, right, between these two great tech powers. Um, on the other hand, I also want this conversation to really get beyond that sort of abstract macro, you know, geostrategic talk and look at how people, you know, really uh, experience the internet. Um, and the sort of online culture and whether all of this noise about what may or may not be happening in China um, or is happening, but, but how it translates down to sort of like the user's experience and the online community. And because sometimes I don't really have a good handle on that. I can, I can read headlines about Jack Ma and Alibaba or, you know, the, the particular race on, on, on what's happening um, in a particular technology, but um, I don't really, you know, Yiling, I'm really going to look to you to, to understand, um, you know, your, is the, is how different is the internet experience in China than it was, you know, uh, a couple of years ago with, with all of this. And, and the other part of this is, you know, I'll just throw this out and then we can get into the conversation and hear from you is, and this sounds a bit silly, but um, is China canceling the internet? The other reason it's sort of playful is uh, the internet in some ways seems like it, it's bigger in China. <laughs> and that might be sort of a, a very simplistic thing to say, but when I read some of the um, profiles that you've done using about um, you know, celebrities online and the way the fan culture, and also the way in which technology was able to allow you know, an economy to sort of catapult past certain stages that we had gone through, in, in the U.S. and I feel like in China, I mean, 
at the risk of overgeneralizing, but you know, payment systems and and the way in which you know the social media was integrated with retail earlier, all of that seems you know, it, and and you can push back if I'm wrong, but like more advanced than China, and certainly like the relationship that you know these streamers have with with the public. Um, how Wu is another former New America Fellow, and his, his you know we did a future tense screening of the People's Republic of Desire, and you know when you watch that movie, that, that, that's a little bit what I mean about wow the internet is bigger and of some of the ground rules, um, you know in a regime that uh, again knows something about canceling uh, people or you know. Um, issues, actions, call it what you might. Um, so that's kind of how we, we wanted to get into this, to think about, um, you know, taking a lot of the, the background context and the big, you know, macro stories that, that you know, Future Tense readers uh, might be familiar with and kind of being like, okay, but what's really actually happening? Um, so Dan, Dan, let me start off on, on the sort of macro national competitiveness. I mean, your, your latest issue, um, has some really provocative pieces on uh, how we should think about, you know, the relationship with China, um, analogies and distinctions with the old Cold War with the Soviet Union. There's an interesting article by E. Bremer talking about, you know, the sort of uh, the, the the tech competition, but also the fact that we have these these some of these tech companies are now supranational, and I guess that's maybe one of the tensions that occurs in China, where maybe the the government felt like, well, <laughs> we can't allow that to happen. Whereas in the U.S., the the discourse is like, let's not rein us in because we don't want, um, we need to keep up with the Chinese companies. Um, but you know, how help us frame kind of before we get into the nitty gritty of what's happening on the internet in China, what's happening in the sort of politics in China, in terms of is there kind of a rethink of some of the liberalization of the last few decades that allowed for the growth of tech companies that looked and seemed very much like our tech companies, but also they might have afforded people a lot of more autonomy in daily life, in their economic life, and also in maybe like the way they connected with each other online. Yeah, well, thanks, Andres. And it's, um, it's, it's great to be back at, uh, at New America. It was a really, um, you know, wonderful place to spend time uh, writing my book and, you know, for all the fellows who have come through, it's kind of provides a really um, uh, unique platform for just kind of spending time and really kind of getting into something seriously as you're trying to, trying to write a book. So I'm, uh, I'm happy to be back. Um, I think we may see um, between our, you know, various freezing zoom screens, um, a version of tech competition playing out here. And we can see whether, uh, <laughs> you know, New York city or Beijing or Mexico city proves to uh, be able to handle this relatively simple task before we, um, you know, get into quantum computing and AI and, you know, uh, yeah. biotech and all that. But, um, you know, let me, I, I, I think one thing that's, you know, you see a lot of, um, as you say, Andres, really kind of abstract um, discussion of tech competition and who's ahead in the tech race in various ways and how each society is is dealing with 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 tech issues. And um, I'm excited to hear from uh, from Yuling and read her book uh, when, when it's out, um, uh, because we, you know, I think too rarely here get really a kind of textured, empirical ground up view of that from China. And, you know, there are reasons why that's, I think, becoming harder in the, the geopolitics and the diplomacy. And um, obviously COVID has, has something to do with this, but uh, the kind of, um, you know, much more textured and less uh, geopolitically or ideologically driven view um, is, is especially valuable. So I'm looking forward to hearing that, but let me try to um, step back a bit and give some context on the kind of U.S.-China relationship, which, you know, as I'm sure everyone here knows, is at a rather um, fraught and, uh, you know, changing moment. Uh, but then also on on um, uh, where things stand in China and how this uh, kind of fits into some of the imperatives there. And I think what is so fascinating and complicated about this set of questions is that both for the, the relationship that wraps in all these incredibly complicated dynamics, and then also for each society and leaders in each society, you know, we all know that we are wrestling with uh, the same set of questions about the role of tech in society and how platforms are regulated and 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 all those questions. So um, it, it it wraps together the kind of domestic and the geopolitical in really fascinating ways. When you look at I mean, this moment in in China, especially for for Xi Jinping, who's at this you know real moment of kind of um, 
uh, both kind of sensitivity, but also consolidation of power. And you've seen a, a number of, of steps, not just within the tech space over the last uh, um, several years, which uh, are, are really about, you know, stamping out rivals and cementing his power and, you know, reversing some of the, the openness that um, had, uh, had, had come to China over the last, in the previous decades. Um, you know, some of that is about the lead up to the National Party Congress next November, which is the moment when, when Xi Jinping is aiming to um, uh, start a third term, people think, and kind of busting through a norm on term limits that have been in place. Uh, there's, you know, the, um, everything from the recent uh, um, resolution on history, kind of elevating him into the kind of pantheon of, of Chinese Communist Party leaders. There's um, uh, a whole host of things that really make this a kind of challenging and interesting moment for for him, and this intersects with tech in in a, in a slew of ways. You know, some of this is about um, going after uh, tycoons who are outspoken, who may you know see themselves as a kind of alternate power center, or who senior CCP leadership sees as an alternative power center. Um, some of it is about um, the relationship between kind of tech and political action. Um, you know, there's been I think over time in future tenses, uh, been an important part of this debate at various points, you know, is, is our various forms of technology going to favor um, democratization, favor ground up pressure in society, or are they going to be tools of surveillance and authoritarian control? And that's a, a very live question, obviously, if you're um, sitting in a, a, a government building or a kind of security office in Beijing. So there, there is that, that dimension of it. And then, you know, I think it's also worth, um, we're saying that you know China is reckoning with a lot of the things that we are reckoning with here when it comes to you know everything from children and screen time to um, uh, economic issues and inequality uh, to you know how how platforms um, interact with other with other parts of business society. So um, there there's this you know really kind of fascinating complicated swirl, and then of course you have the whole geopolitical dimension and the, and the the fact of U.S. China competition, which has made um, you know, technology one of the, the kind of central playing fields and central arenas for this competition. I think you had the US CIA director talking about it as a, a main arena for competition and rivalry between China and the US. You had uh, you know, Xi Jinping talking about uh, technological innovation as one of the main uh, battlegrounds of the global playing field. So you have both sides who, who see it that way. And that again also plays out in a whole um, whole host of different of different arenas, and that's everything from you know the the race to be ahead in you know five G or quantum computing and AI. It's about um, supply chains, and uh, there's obviously been in the U.S. A, a push to kind of crack down on the access of Chinese companies to to U.S. technology and supplies. Um, and then there's also, you know, the question of kind of international standards and how each government is interacting with uh, international bodies, um, formal and informal, that are trying to set international standards on tech. So that's obviously a, you know, a, 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 a complicated set of considerations um, and the fact of um, a growing tension in the, in the U.S.-China relationship makes all of them more complicated to deal with. So um, I will I will leave it there and uh, turn to Yi Ling for I suppose more texture on on the crackdown and what, what that actually looks like from the ground in Beijing. So I think we've lost Andres momentarily. Is that feeling? Do you is that do you see him anywhere? I don't see him. Um, no Andres. Okay. I can just speak to some of the things you're saying and you know how uh, some of the changes are being felt on ground. Um, one thing that I would say just from a bigger kind of, uh, you know, bird's eye view before zooming in is that, um, oh, Andreas is back potentially, but I'll just continue. Um, I think that actually there's something a little bigger taking place behind the crackdown um, on the internet. And I, I think that will help us contextualize what's uh, taking place on the ground, which is I do feel like uh, what has been taking place in the last year in China, really starting from you know, uh, Jack Ma's kind of fall from grace after the Ant IPO was canceled is a kind of aggressive reining in of all of the excesses of, I think what China perceives to be as neoliberalism effectively. Um, in the sense that when we look at something like the crackdown on, for example, education technology companies, um, that's a very kind of multi-pronged story um, that doesn't just have to do with ed tech, right? I think on one hand, it has to do with the fact that it wants to rein in 
a internet company like New Oriental, uh, which has done immensely well uh, in China over the last decade. On the other hand, I think, uh, you know, the, the crackdown on after school tutoring has much more to do with the fact um, that people are burnt out and that uh, the government can see this kind of extreme inequality within the education system. Uh, um, even Xi Jinping and his kind of common prosperity speech where he said, you know, we're, we're done with letting uh, some people get rich first. Now we're going to kind of bring about common prosperity. Um, a big part of it is uh, what he called involution, right? Which was a, a word that sprouted on the online internet um, where a lot of uh, kind of Chinese people were basically complaining about this kind of excessive competition and burnout that was um, driving them towards growth with no kind of spiritual meaning or purpose. And so this viral obscure word from like scholarly anthropology uh, suddenly got, uh, finally got picked up um, in Xi Jinping's speech. And so a lot of the kind of crackdowns are designed to address that. Um, and with the education piece, there's also the kind of ideological piece, right? Uh, a lot of it has been, or a par part of it has been about kind of banning foreign teachers and kind of uh, steering away foreign influence. Um, and so that's one part of it as well, uh, not to mention demographics, right? This kind of like shrinking uh, aging population. Uh, a lot of people don't necessarily see how uh, a crackdown on tutoring has anything to do with demographics, but there's a huge linkage there in the sense that um, Chinese people uh, increasingly so don't want to have babies, uh, not, not one, not to mention three, which is kind of what the government is aggressively pushing now. And um, a huge part of it is that babies are expensive. Um, and, you know, the average Chinese person spends like up to half their income on their kids like education and tutoring fees. And so a lot of this crackdown is about uh, getting Chinese parents to start having children again. And so um, I guess the broader point I'm trying to make here is that, you know, when we see something like New Oriental, uh, you know, first education company to do its IPO in the New York Stock Exchange, like plummets, uh, and, you know, the whole company is falling apart and swerves to selling vegetables, um, <laughs> there have been a, a whole kind of series of factors that have been, um, you know, in the making for a long time that have kind of kind of made the final push for, for the government to introduce, uh, you know, such a regulation among a whole slew of other ones. Um, yeah, and so I guess that that's kind of one, one point that I would make. I did want to ask about the, uh, the case of, of Peng Shui, uh, the tennis player, and that's really, ca I think, captured a lot of uh, people's imagination and, and attention, and we saw what the reaction of the world Tennis Association, um, but in terms of the, the the censorship angle and the way in which um, you know people online uh, relate to a story like that, um, you know, how does that how has that episode played into um, the the trends that we've seen recently, um, or is it just you know somewhat you know separate um, in the sense that could have happened five years ago or just I'm just curious for like your reaction in terms of how you've seen this story play out perhaps in our media that that might be missing something or might be different from you know what what you're seeing on the ground. Yeah, to be honest, I think you know what makes the Peng Shui case so fascinating is. Um, a, that it has kind of implicated the kind of highest levels of leadership, like, you know, speaking out kind of uh, uh, against sexual harassment has been taking a place for a while now, uh, particularly after 2017, when the feminist movement and the Me Too movement started, you know, kicking off here in China. But um, so the kind of most uh, important and interesting part of it is that it is implicating higher levels of leadership. And then the second part I would say is interesting is that um, that the WTA is involved, right? And so that there is huge kind of international attention um, that is continuing to sustain itself and it's gonna you know, implicate um, uh, the business world and the tennis community um, more broadly. But, you know, like 
seeing how things are taking place here, uh, it very much feels like the censorship machine is just going into its usual mode. Like it's just mm -hmm. playing out what it always does, maybe a little bit more effectively and kind of more quickly uh, than it would have a decade ago or even five years ago. But, you know, it, it almost feels like, it just feels like business as usual. Like the thing goes up, it goes up for 20 minutes, then it's scrubbed off all platforms. Then all the keywords are kind of aggressively taken down. You know, everything from like, it's not just like, her name, like Takashi and Zhang Li, it's like, uh, you know, you'll have like a cat and mouse game of like uh, users putting down words like uh, Mike Pence and Serena Williams, or like the prime mm. minister and I, which is like a Korean, you know, TV drama and like all of that, all related words, tennis, right. um, you know, will just be taken down. And um, it's, it's very uh, kind of sweeping and aggressive, but it, it kind of works like it, at least domestically, right? It just, it disappears from the public conversation. Like it's around, floating around, you know, people are talking about it. And then after a while, public amnesia set, settles in pretty quickly and the moment passes, at least domestically. I think the challenge here and where that model of censorship just does not work as well is in the international kind of community, right? Outside the firewall, that kind of like, okay, we're just gonna forget it all happened, just simply does not work. And so the approach there is kind of right. this, like, and I think that's what's a little new, right? Is this kind of like the presence of like state media, like Global Times is Hu Zin, like saying, well, she's totally fine, right? And like putting out these videos of her, like having dinner with her friends. And so that feels a lot clumsier and like ineffective, yeah. but it seems like, um, they just don't really have any idea how to deal with it on a kind of uh, international stage. But, you know, and I think domestically, it, it definitely feels like that's just how things have been dealt with for a while. Right. And I, I guess if, if I'm, uh, you know, President uh, Xi Jinping or, or you know, in, in, the from the Chinese government's position, I would imagine that the reason why this case is doubly fraught is it's coming on the eve of the, the Winter Olympics. I mean, pretty much that's that's going to be here before we know it, right, in February. Um, mm -hmm. So in terms of the interplay between uh, the, the domestic scene and, and this international realm where it's harder to control, as, as you've mentioned, um, the, this is very inconvenient timing for a, a, a case like this to break for the, for the, for the government. Um, and there were probably there probably already was a fair amount of concern about international media or potential for activism around the Olympics, which um, can be tampered down to some extent by the the pandemic and the controls adjacent to that. Uh, but do you, when you look forward to the to the Olympics as a flashpoint, um, is there um, you know how does this case play into that, and what what do you expect that we might see or not see around the Olympics in terms of uh, uh, people, you know, dissent or activism, um, some of it may be imported to the extent that one can during a, a pandemic when they're not allowing a lot of uh, international visitors. I don't foresee any kind of huge changes from like, I, I don't, I, do, I certainly don't foresee any type of dissent and activism, particularly not from on the ground, um, but, you know, I, I do think that there will be like a huge kind of ramping up of security. I think that, you know, sensors will go into overdrive. Um, everything will be sensitive. Um, but, you know, I think the Winter Olympics in some ways is just like another, just like scaled up version of an important event. And what happens during important events is uh, things get scrubbed off a little more kind of aggressively and people who, um, you know, are, are perceived as kind of like threats will be, uh, you know, silenced. And so I, I don't think that there is anything particularly special about the Winter Olympics, other than that it is an important event and they will do what takes right. place around important events. Yeah. Okay. 
I'm just, um, can I can I ask you Ling, a question about the way the diplomatic boycott is being is being um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, discussed there? I mean, to what extent yeah. is that has that been um, has there been a decision to make that a major topic of conversation, and how is that being being yeah. talked about? You know, from the the external um, messaging of of Chinese yeah. government officials, there you know uh, seem very happy to point out how few countries have so far joined with the U.S. and yeah. Uh, in the boycott so far, but um, I imagine that yeah. uh, is also an opportunity to push a certain message domestically. So I'm really curious how that looks from your your vantage there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so far, not really discussed it. it. You know, I have to like discuss with people more, but it isn't this kind of like huge inflammatory subject that people are enraged about. It's kind of almost just like a, a side note. You know, maybe I'm not an athlete or I'm not like deep in the athletics kind of circle. But I mean, um, I think that the messaging that at least, uh, you know, Chinese diplomats are putting out and kind of Chinese state media is putting out does seem to echo to a certain extent, the sentiment that is on the ground, which is, I mean, there is a pretty funny tweet that someone put out recently where uh, one of the kind of state media folks was like, in this almost like childish, like spurned, like teenage lover voice was just like, well, we didn't invite you anyway. <laughs> and um, the, the tweet was something like, this has a, um, I didn't break up with you, or you didn't break up with me, I broke up with you vibes. And so um, I do think that it, it sends important messaging kind of internationally and in, to the international community, though I don't know to what extent like it is really kind of felt or discussed in any great depth uh, domestically. Thank you. Um, we, I just want to remind our audience too that uh, we'd, we'd love to have questions from from all of you. I, I see a, I think a couple have come in, but um, you can you can pose a question in the slide box to the right of the video. So um, please please uh, chime in. Um, Dan, I wanted to quick to ask you something quickly about, about this in the, uh, I hear from Yiling that, that, you know, there's actually a fair amount of continuity here and, you know, the, the, the Chinese government's ability to, to control the message and to, um, you know, police what is being talked about online in cases like this, you know, remains pretty formidable, um, regardless of what we might think. Um, but when she also mentioned the, the, the more difficult uh, uh, challenge that maybe they're not as successful in, in terms of the international dynamic. And related to that, I'm wondering if you think that um, we're just gonna see so, it's, it's increasingly difficult for uh, Western multinationals to be in China, right? On the one hand, we're, we're incredibly, you know, the, the supply chain is there, um, it's been tried recently, but, but you know, the, we're, our economies are so tightly intertwined. And yet on the other hand, particularly in the tech space, you've seen a lot of companies withdraw. I think LinkedIn was, was, a, was a prominent um, company that, you know, platform that decided that it just, it, it couldn't do it. I mean, the Google saga about whether to be in, in, in China or not, given like the, the, what you have to do to be there is, 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 is a long story that, that goes way back. Um, so we've seen this sort of, you know, part of the narrative up until this recent crackdown was that China was gonna have this, this formidable tech space internet that was gonna be sort of parallel to ours right behind this firewall. But in terms of like other brands that are more, you know, consumer consumer brands like, you know, the Nikes and the Coca-Colas of the world. I mean, obviously those companies are, are very much still present in China. Um, there've been pressure on them at times and even congressional hearings about, you know, well, are, are you, you know, what are your facilities in Western China? And are, you know, the questions about potential prison labor or the, you know, as as consumer activism in, increases and there's awareness on hu certain human rights issues, there might be more pressure borne on, on entities to withdraw. I mean, the World Tennis Association, I guess, would be an example of this, right? Um, so that kind of activism might be present in in and around the Olympics, right? The sponsors and, and just going forward, like, do you think that that this might be part of a decoupling that might occur in terms of our, our very close ties with China that's less about at the government level and how that might percolate into uh, worsening ties if we just become 
more and more divorced on in terms of like uh, you know our brands on the te- in the tech space, but but elsewhere as well. Um, yeah, no, it's, something- it, it's it's a it's a great and big question. I mean, in some ways, I think the kind of dynamics around decoupling of this was became some ways uh, a dimension of official U.S. policy, and the word kind of came into common usage during the Trump administration. I think the dynamics had been at play for um, uh, several years before that, and they were driven by imperatives on on both sides, right? both in the U.S. and China. Um, you know, Xi Jinping uh, several years ago sort of talking about made in China 2025 and driving self-sufficiency mm-hmm. in the whole slew of sectors, including um, uh, many tech sectors, uh, the you know, the attempts to limit, you know, I think quite successfully or not completely uh, what most Chinese users of the internet can see and what they, you know, what they consume about uh, scandals that might seem to be getting a lot of play in foreign press, but be getting much less attention um, for the average uh, uh, Chinese reader. Um, You know, on the U.S. side, you had all the, you know, tech companies you mentioned um, struggling to figure out how to operate in both markets and address the, you know, uh, kinds of pressures they were going to get from either consumers or regulators in in the U.S. or other other Western markets with the demands that they were facing in China. So all of those dynamics were playing out even before uh, you saw decoupling becoming a much more kind of official part of of U.S. policy in the in the Trump years. And I think you have again a kind of uh, set of dynamics that are in some ways pushing in other directions. So there's clearly going to be um, some continuing degree of of this kind of divide. Um, in sectors that are deemed sensitive by one side or the other for uh, for one reason or another. Um, you're also going to see more and more companies just struggling to, um, you know, balance those two imperatives. And that's true of, of tech most, uh, most notably, but you see, you know, um, Ray Dalio, for example, uh, raised a big new China fund uh, recently. And, um, you know, he's had to answer questions about, uh, the Uyghurs and about uh, Hong Kong and about you know a variety of other human rights issues that I think probably three or four years ago, if you were a big investor, you just wouldn't um, have been you know as he, he's tried to say, look, that's not my business or expertise, but that's not really an answer that in the U.S. context you're able to get away with in the, in the same way. And similarly, if you're you know a, a clothing manufacturer or an, or, or an advertiser, you uh, similarly kind of have to have something to say about. Um, you know, supply chains in Xinjiang or, or, or other issues that are um, of increasing salience. You know, Hollywood would be another example where uh, China is an incredibly important market to Hollywood studios, mm-hmm. and they've been trying very hard to get in. But you're kind of growing attention on some of the uh, self-censorship that uh, Hollywood has resorted to in order to uh, find inroads into the market. So um, you, you have it within the tech space, but then also much more broadly. And then, you know, probably most, uh, I don't know if it's most consequential, but quite consequentially also on the kind of people to people level, you know, for a long time, um, there was a, I think a pretty deliberate attempt, um, to really promote lots of people to people interaction and to encourage the, you know, flow of students back and forth. And, um, that has gotten caught up in this swirl of, you know, security concerns and, you know, speculation about, uh, uh, whether there are, you know, kind of Chinese spies hiding in graduate departments right. and concerns about, you know, Chinese American researchers. Um, and, and you know, you can, surely there are some uh, valid concerns there, but as you, as that plays out on the ground, it kind of goes to an extreme very, very quickly. And I think kind of tends to get caught up in um, a swirl of, uh, of uh, you know, kind of panicked um, uh, reactions. And, and, and all of that is, again, just going to kind of reinforce these these dynamics on both sides and obviously the pandemic and the fact that um, there's been very little travel and especially, you know, with China, which, you know, it's worth saying is um, committed to a, a strategy that has been very effective, but also um, doesn't offer um, uh, a clear kind of roadmap out of the pandemic um, that we're all still, you know, struggling with in different ways right now. So um, that in the, you know, as, as these um, geopolitical dy- dy- dynamics play out makes it much harder, I think, for both sides to have a real sense of, uh, of what others are thinking. And, you know, certainly at the diplomatic level, you would have much, much more in the way of exchanges and, and really kind of serious substantive exchange, you know, five or seven years ago, uh, both official and kind of semi-official. And a lot of that has slowed down quite a bit, which just, you know, uh, mm-hmm. reinforces misperception and miscalculation, whatever else. Yeah. And, and as you know, that's, that's, that's an, an issue of interest and importance to us at, at Arizona State, where we have thousands of, of Chinese students and um, 
you know, we obviously as a, as a, uh, as part of our mission and selfishly, I guess people could point out as part of our, uh, you know, overall health of the institution, um, having those exchanges and having uh, international students is, is, is really uh, important. And you've had a global pandemic and, and this sort of changing tenor of uh, foreign policy, national, you know, security talk um, uh, affect that um, in some ways. And, I, you know, that reminds me, I was curious that the, your latest issue of, of foreign affairs also has this poll, um, the back page where you, 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 you asked dozens of experts whether they agreed or disagreed with the um, statement that we've become too hostile to China. Which, and the, um, well, what's really interesting about the results is it, it seems just eyeballing here, uh, pretty evenly divided with, with experts. I, I guess what, like 50, 60 experts are asked um, something in that ballpark and, and it's pretty evenly divided. And I know a, a couple of years ago, um, you and I were at dinner with, with President Crow of ASU and, and um, a couple of people in the room, and I think including President Crow, felt that um, you know, uh, Washington had become too enamored of the sort of Cold War um, framing network and that maybe uh, a lot of people, more people in the room then might have said we were, we were being too hostile, but I suppose recent events might have been giving some ammunition or uh, debating points to people who feel like we need to be more um, uh, sterner, uh, hawkish towards China. But then you get into the debates about, well, what's, what, how you, you know, is this a self-fulfilling prophecy and who's reacting to whose rhetoric and, um, I, I don't expect yeah. you to have like a definitive take, but yeah. I would, I know, I'm just throwing it out there. No, I mean, I, I was thinking about that um, that event we did with uh, with Michael Crow, the president of Arizona State, um, who I, I think said uh, fairly crisply, "Look, you know, a couple of years ago, the U.S. government was encouraging me to, you know, open a um, uh, uh, you know Chinese language center on campus <laughs> and bring as many students in as possible, and now." You know, it's like I get threatening letters from the Department of Defense telling me I'm going to lose, you know, funding for things if, um, if we don't, uh, you know, uh, track these things more carefully, which I think just indicates how dramatic and, and you know, market that shift was in a very short amount of time. And I think what is really striking about this poll that is in our current issue and in, on, on our on our website, you can kind of see the full breakdown of all these answers. It, it followed when we did. Uh, in 2018 or 2019, asking um, respondents whether uh, Chinese and American national interests were incompatible, um, and and you know not getting at the foreign policy question, but at this kind of core interest question. And I think what is really striking to me about both these is that while there's really wide variation, and you know people on um, who, who argue uh, very vehemently and with you know high degree of confidence that uh, U.S. policy has become too hostile to China, or vice versa, as as you know not hostile enough. Um, uh, that it really does not break down uh, politically or ideologically among the American respondents in an obvious way. So you have people who, you know, are kind of traditionally associated with the kind of, you know, human rights left who are much more focused on uh, Hong Kong or, or speech mm -hmm. issues or, um, or, or, or Uyghurs who uh, have, have been part of this turn. You also have kind of more traditional uh, defense hawks um, and, and, and um, you know, on the flip side, you have kind of, um, you know, progressives who are, you know, concerned about uh, uh, a new kind of, you know, um, uh, hardline approach in national security. You have uh, kind of people on the right who really just want a degree of restraint in American foreign policy. So it's been, I think, kind of scrambled the, the politics on the U.S. side in interesting ways, um, you know, not to mention there are certainly versions of this debate playing out. Um, uh, within within China as well, so I think it's a you know the the new paradigm is still um, kind of trying to be defined, and um, yeah. part of what we were trying to get at in this recent issue was this idea that you know we kind of fall back into these Cold War habits. You know, it wasn't meant to be kind of endorsement of the Cold War, but an exploration of those dynamics and and how we get into them. And because that I think is the kind of muscle memory for lots of people in the 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 U.S. foreign policy world. You know, that kind of tends to become right. the framework through which people see things. And it is it is interesting how, in contrast to the um, Cold War years uh, with the Soviets, I mean, th this really is often driven by concerns about um, 
technology, technological advantage. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I was in college back in the, you know, Reagan Gorbachev years and, and nobody was worried that the Soviet Union was going to sort of outdo the, you know, the West when it came to uh, technologies. It was, it was, you know, the concern was, it was just like raw military, you know, territorial issues and, and, and not, you know, oh my gosh, they're going to, uh, outpace us when it comes to artificial intelligence or, you know, synthetic biology or, or the things that we talk about in this, you know, contest with China, in addition to what does feel like a more traditional geopolitical context, contest. But Yiling, I, I do want us to get back to China and, and back online. Um, you know, we used to talk about, like, how does this affect people on the street? Like, I want to know how this affects people online, because you were talking about the, you know, the, what we've seen in terms of the changing official attitudes and relationships towards, you know, the Alibabas of the world, um, you know, the online uh, education space that you talked about, you know, we know about the, the cancellation of the Ant Group I, IPO that was related to Alibaba, but getting beyond that, more down to the level of, uh, you know, Liu Mama, who I think was the name of the, of the person you profiled in that great New Yorker piece, uh, I think the Headline, I'm looking at the title, Liu Mama's Everyday Life. And this was a, uh, a, a farmer, a peasant who was streaming, right? And became this, this internet sensation. And um, uh, I think, you know, there was this term that you use in the article about broadcast jockeys. And there was a sense that, you know, you could um, uh, have quite uh, celebrityhood and success, and which would translate into commercial success online and people could connect and have these communities. And this was also the subject of how Wu's film. And I, I wonder if, if that kind of, um, you know, more uh, grassroots, if it's the right term, uh, but sp spontaneous um, coming together online around, you know, non-political issues like that, if, if that's changed at all, if, if there's any kind of dampening of that energy on the Chinese internet, regardless of what's happening politically between, you know, Tencent and Alibaba and the Chinese government? Like, is, is that trickling down to that kind of ability for us to go online and, and create community? Definitely. I mean, I think the, the way that I would frame it is, uh, you know, how kind of the bigger picture has kind of trickled down into um, everyday life. And, you know, in this specific example, online celebrity or kind of like online influence. Um, I have started to think of the kind of developmental trajectory of the Chinese internet in kind of three phases. Mm -hmm. um, and so if we think about kind of pre-2013 or more kind of like the, the heady kind of period of the Olympics, very optimistic, relatively open. Um, before that, um, I think of the Chinese internet very much so, aside from kind of like a bare bones firewall, uh, with the same optimism of, as the global net, right? There's this idea that this was a town hall, Weibo, very much like Twitter, was going to like spark a information revolution. Um, people were kind of speaking truth to power. There was a massive train crash in Wenzhou in 2011, and suddenly you have citizen journalists flocking to the scene. Um, very much kind of like uh, relatively under-regulated kind of lots of diverse voices on the field and overwhelmingly liberal. So uh, a lot of the kind of influencers of that time were very liberal, um, kind of like writers who were finally finding the internet as this kind of uh, space they could express themselves. I think a big turning point to, I think what we see as the Leo Mama kind of period was 2013 where uh, the the kind of the government appointed this guy called Liu Wei as the head of the cyberspace administration, and he used a phrase which I think really much, very much characterizes the internet that I know and that I've written about basically mm -hmm. up until recently. I think that that stage has ended, um, which is he described it as a spiritual garden, kind of this garden, this walled garden where you know inside lots of things can flourish as long as it's kind of pruned carefully pruned on the outside of any type of foreign influence. And so this is kind of the internet as we've known it for uh, you know, the last five or six years where 
there's no Google, no Facebook, no Twitter, like international kind of tech companies have been kicked out one by one. But, you know, not only have these copycats emerged as they were called back in the day, um, but they've kind of taken on a life of their own. And so this is the, you know, the, the Alibaba is kind of growing, the, the bite dance is starting to form at this period. And, you know, the idea that you can have uh, a online life that is like extremely integrated into kind of offline presence. I think Andre, as you were mentioning earlier, right? Like does the internet seem almost bigger in China? I would say bigger in the sense that it's like so inextricably bound into everyday life, right? From the kind of um, uh, leapfrogging of like uh, online payments technology and to like now the fact that everywhere I go, I need to show a health code, right? Like, it, like I can't right. go anywhere really without my phone. Um, and so, this is kind of the period where there is kind of like a lot of innovation and kind of like a great flowering of ideas, but within these very tightly bound constraints. Um, I would say like that period has definitively maybe come to an end, uh, particularly with the recent set of um, uh, kind of regulatory policies um, in that, uh, kind of the idea that it's not just kind of political sensitivity that is no longer um, okay. Uh, it, it's really kind of like excessive wealth, kind of spiritual pollution um, and vulgarity. And so there's this like uh, economic piece that's not okay. Like if you're a celebrity that's like making too much money or flaunting your wealth, that is mm -hmm. uh, a no-no. And um, the other thing, that is out is uh, that has been previously perceived with a lot more kind of openness and tolerance is um, stuff like LGBT uh, issues like that used to be kind of like more of a freewheeling space on the internet. But recently I think both as a kind of reaction to uh, LGBT civil society groups and the fear of kind of formation as well as maybe just like a more kind of conservative patriarchal mm -hmm. um, take on what online space should look like. Um, there's been a clamping down on that as well. And so this is the first time where I think it's not just about kind of like walling off um, like external influence, but also like the creation of a very kind of like conservative or much more conservative, uh, much more kind of controlled uh, ideological narrative. Um, and so that that's kind of the, the shift that I see taking place now. Um, just a quick note there, like I think a celebrity now who can thrive in this space is this woman called Li Zizi, who's like viral both in China and across the world for farming, like for, for kind of like planting her own crops in the Sichuanese countryside. And because she speaks all the right buzzwords, common prosperity, yeah. rural revitalization, um, and she has recently done an interview with CCTV, the state media, where she said, uh, what I'm going to do is influence youngsters away from being influencers, right? That's the, that's the energy of the moment. That's fascinating. Sorry, that, that, no, 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 that was, that was fascinating. Um, and that's, that's what I was wondering about. And uh, you've given us a really good understanding. Um, the the because the platform on which a lot of the streaming happened. My understanding is that it started as a gaming platform, and is it? Um, I don't know how. It, you know, it, is it Y Y? But it's probably not pronounced that way. Yeah, that... I mean, given how how internet platforms are changing, like barely anyone uses Y Y now, right? That was like 2016, okay. and uh, I watched uh, how it was brilliant documentary too. But now everyone's on Douyin or Kuaishou. And those were okay. just burgeoning at that time. Doing is bite dances. Um, so are they being, uh, uh, are they waning in, in influence or is it just that the content is changing? Like you said, you know, you have to readjust your. The content is changing. I think it is, it speaks to bite dances kind of like political savviness and its ability to survive in this like ex yeah. extremely a challenging environment. Like it's just split itself into two, right? It's like pulled yeah. to Voldemort and there's like Douyin and TikTok. <laughs> um, but um, uh, it's just, it's, it's the content. It's increasingly uh, patriotic. Um, it's increasingly kind of clean. Um, it's right. filled with what the government likes to call positive energy, right? And so 
little mama like a crude farmer like spitting dirty rhymes like on video not positive energy right and so you see her content become more like this like wholesome cooking show um um so yeah that that's kind of the shift that's taking place um there is a uh, <clears throat> somebody wrote in a question sent a question uh we touched upon this a little bit but it's 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 interesting and worth um so, so the question is, if, if the Chinese government wants to censor foreign influence and culture, why do they want to participate in the Olympics if it is such an international event? So what's what's your, your sense of that? Like if, if you're adverse to all these influences and, and want to retain strong control, isn't it, aren't you sort of opening the Pandora's box or, um, or, or is this just sort of a uh, confidence that, you, you can have it both ways. You can bring in the world through the Olympics and show what you want to show. And, but I think that's, that's the, where the question is, is headed. Like, if you want to be so controlling, why would you want to host the Olympics? Dan, do you want to speak on that? I mean, I, I think there's a long, um, you know, uh, there's, a, a, there's some great political science work. We ran a piece um, by um, Don Mercati and Bill Woolforth uh, earlier this year about why authoritarian states have, have traditionally been really attached to the Olympics and seeing that as a means of kind of projecting power and you know pursuing uh, I think great rival, great power rivalry by other means was their phrase. And I think in, in in China's case it is a matter of you know when to have it both ways and I think you see this in lots of other of other countries as well. Um, there is a you know desire to project influence to um, you know it's it's not a matter of that there's a kind of endless debate about the extent to which there is a China model that um, that the state is trying to um, bring to other parts of the world, but there's certainly a really concerted influence, and this has been, you know, a, a major part of uh, Xi Jinping's foreign policy over the last several years to project uh, economic and political power and in in the, the region military power um, through a variety of means. So if you look at you know a lot of what uh, the Chinese have done in international organizations, um, within your UN organizations and others, uh, Belt and Road, you know, kind of huge investment initiative and infrastructure initiative um, that has, you know, now uh, span, spans much of the world. So there is this real desire to kind of project that power and the Olympics is a kind of great way to um, uh, to, to highlight that or has, has traditionally been the 2008 Olympics. Um, you know, people might remember as this real kind of uh, important, almost, uh, you know, pitched as almost this kind of coming out party for, for the new China. Um, and so uh, it, it, it is an opportunity to kind of show this model and, and show a degree of pride um, to, to the rest of the world. And, you know, I think the, the question is, does the, the boycott and um, controversy over whether it's, you know, over uh, um, uh, Peng Shui or others, you know, to what extent does that become the story or is there still a kind of narratives that, that much of the world will see that will project this kind of pride and strength? Um, I'm curious how that looks from, from you know, your vantage sitting in, in Beijing, Yiling, but um, I think that's the kind of geopolitics of this question at least. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, I would say that um, it's not trying to kind of like censor foreign culture and influence kind of as a blanket, like all foreign culture and influence, like people are, you know, listening to foreign music, consuming foreign brands, like yeah, at a kind of un, in ways that, that are unprecedented, right? Mm -hmm. I think specifically it's trying to curtail foreign influence that has any um, like, potential to undermine uh, its authority. And so if they think that the Olympics is something that won't, then um, it seems like as, as, as you know, sports is allegedly this kind of um, ideologically uh, agnostic ground, then that's, that's why they are deciding to participate. Well, I love that phrase. I, I, <clears throat> Dan knows that I'm, I'm really interested into thinking about um, this, you know, the impact of sport on society and politics. And I, I love that phrase that you just used dealing about it being ostensibly um, ideologically agnostic because um, ostensibly is, is a key word there too. Um, we're almost out of time unbelievably because it's flown by, but I do wanna just try to squeeze in one last question from Adam, sent in by Adam M. Because uh, this is really interesting. Um, given, and to, to both of you, um, any whatever it elicits. Um, given China's domestic control of their digital terrain, 
how or in what ways is China currently using the internet as a tool of statecraft internationally? Any, any thoughts on that? I, I can answer it really, really quickly. I realize we don't have much time, but you know, I think you see it um, in a, you know, I think it's, it's a really important to the projection of, of Chinese influence and you see it in everything from, you know, the fight over shaping tech standards, um, the export of surveillance technology, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the fight over, over, over 5G and kind of semiconductor production, um, the, um, uh, all of the ways in which, um, you know, this um, intersects with military power, right? So a lot of the questions about, you know, what would happen in the Taiwan Strait is really about, you know, technology in various ways. So you kind of see that run. I realize we could spend half an hour talking about each of those, but I think you see it running through, um, lots of these different uh, pr projections of power. And in some ways, this is a place where you see, um, you know, the US and China and others, you know, Europe's a very important uh, force in some of the tech regulation stuff, you know, kind of trying to project these different visions and working very actively to, you know, kind of sell different parts of the world on their, uh, you know, actual technology, their approach to standards, their approach to, um, uh, to a, lot of, a lot of these key questions. So you see it as both a kind of tool, but also an arena. Really? Yeah, I agree with what Dan said, though. Uh, only one thing I would add is just like in terms of shaping the narrative, like in terms of storytelling, which I think in comparison to some of the hardware is just a little less kind of sophisticated, right? It's just like state media on Twitter. Um, and I, I do think it will become more sophisticated, but right, like mm -hmm. as of now, like the narrative seems to be another way in which the internet is trying, I mean, they're using the internet as, as a form of statecraft. Yeah, th this is not exactly high tech, but it's where there was this fascinating white paper on democracy that um, that the, the that was put out by China in the context of the American Summit for Democracy. And it just is kind of amaz amazing to see this, you know, debate playing out both on, you know, uh, on Twitter, but also through this, you know, kind of very traditional form. When I first read this question, in addition to, you know, debates around things like, like Huawei and 5G standards, I was also thinking about the sort of, you know, uh, admittedly very, um, you know, somewhat um, farcical uh, debates we had around TikTok and its ownership um, in, you know, farcical in the context of like the overwrought EC politics, but, but it was, it did connect to the sort of, um, I think, anxiety that, that that people outside of China might have at the prospect that some, you know, that we might see can, you know, more and more big consumer brands um, coming in from China and, it, and that becoming more of a two way street than, you know, that we're more accustomed to sort of the default shared uh, tech platforms, brands that, you know, being kind of ours being exported to put it, to put it crudely. And, uh, you know, lo and behold, suddenly all our teenagers were on a, platform that that was that was coming from China and, and and that just gave rise to all sorts of you know concerns and and some you know were might have been a little bit overdone but I, I wonder um, Yiling, do you think we'll, we'll see more uh, Chinese um, brands platforms coming to our shores or I guess the question is are we going to see a stifling of innovation as a result of the current um, situation, which is always the debate, you know, we get in the States, like, don't over-regulate tech, tech companies, or this is all going to come to an end. And that's a very big question to, to, to end on. And we have about you know, a minute. Let people go. It's the million, million dollar question. And I always hesitate to prognosticate because some, like, we tend to be wrong. Um, but I would say, yes, in terms of, like, hardware, like, yes, in terms of what kind of trying to conceive is, like, useful growth, I think, you know, in terms of like semiconductors and batteries and like electric vehicles, I, I still foresee like a lot of innovation taking place. But, you know, if it's going to be like ByteDance 2.0, like, or the new social media platform, or like a fashion brand, or like, mm -hmm. you know, like a, a, a film, I, I think I'm less, I'm less inclined to think that something innovative and new will, will happen there. Great. Um, Dan, anything on this or? No, I will. I will. With, with that, okay. uh, Yuling have the last word on that. Excellent. Well, uh, <clears throat> apologies. I've, I've kept you both a couple of minutes over. 
I would love to continue talking to you both for a couple of hours, but um, alas, we, we must let you go. And thank you everybody who's tuned into this. This is, um, we appreciate your being here and I apologize um, for um, our, our tech difficulties and, and, and my Wi-Fi in particular. I'm really glad that um, I was the person uh, kicked off and, and not one of our indispensable experts. So I really appreciate you, Ling, and Dan, you being with us and we'll continue to, to follow your, your writings and, and publications and, and can't wait to, uh, to read your book, Yuling, and, and to uh, read your reporting in the meantime. So thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks so much. Thank you.